security. It's an aspect of Apache Kafka that's evolved a lot over the years. I mean, in the very early days, you just ran Kafka locally and security was entirely your problem to think about. But that was a long time ago. Things have moved on. These days, there's out of the box this and pluggable options for that. There are things to do with authentication and authorization, encryption, and even things like quality of service guarantees, where you can specify how much bandwidth each consumer can use. So it being a very important and large topic, we thought it was time to bring in an expert to get us back up to speed on the current state of Kafka security. And along the way, get a little of the backstory about how it got to its current state. So the expert we have with us is Regini Savaram. I'd like to tell you that she wrote the book on Kafka security, but I don't think it's a whole book quite yet. So I can tell you she wrote the security section of Kafka, The Definitive Guide, and she's going to give us the tour. Before we get started, this podcast is brought to you by Confluent Developer, which is our education site for Kafka. More about that at the end, but for now, I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Streaming Audio. Let's get into it. Joining me today is Regini Savaram. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Chris, how are you? I'm very well. I'm looking forward to this. You're going to teach me some more up-to-date things about security. I hope so. <laughs> So let me get this straight. So you are a principal engineer at Confluent, um, and you've you've been um, working on things like security features for Kafka and geo replication for I think, about seven years. Is that right? Yeah. So we st- I started working on security for Apache Kafka around seven years ago, and um, recently, of late, I've been working on geo replication for Confluent Platform and Confluent Cloud. Two very tasty subjects. Um, so. We can get into security in a moment, but you've also, let me get your other um, credentials on the table. You're also the co-author of uh, Kafka, The Definitive Guide, right? That's right. I must be fun. to the second edition of the book, which was out last year. Ah. What's it like? Because they're like four co-authors. What's it like coordinating four people writing a book? So it was a very interesting experience for me because I've never written a book before. And... um, the first version of the book was already quite popular. So writing up to that level was, uh, it, it was quite an interesting experience. And also I started off with writing the chapter on Kafka security because at the time in the, when the first edition was written, there was no security in Kafka. So this was the very first time we were introducing security for Kafka into a book. So right. that was quite interesting. I can see why they hauled you in for that chapter though. So maybe that's where we should start this security story, because in the in the early days, Kafka didn't really have any security beyond SSL, right? Yeah, so when I first started working on Kafka all those years ago, there was no security at all. So it was just plain text. And <laughs> this was in 0.8-something. Which we year were, is this? Give me the timeline. Um, around 20... Oh, oh, well, I don't remember the exact year, but it's like over seven years ago, I think it was. When okay. I started. So sometime um, in the early ish 2010s. Yeah. Right. 2015, maybe. Um, and we were thinking of putting Kafka on cloud as a, and provide it as a service. So, uh, without security, obviously, we can't do that. So, that's how I first started working on security. Right. We had some interest in the community at that time, and we were talk of adding SSL and also Kerberos into Kafka. And so my initial work was mostly testing those features, doing the reviews. And from then on, I started, uh, I think I haven't stopped. (laughs) Yeah. Security is a job that never stops, right? Exactly. But how how do you actually test something like that? I mean, did you, did you, was there a lot of external auditing of it or were you working with partners to try and hammer down whether this is actually secure? What's the process you go through? So it, to start with, it was all the internal testing that we had to do to make sure that the, we were using standard protocols. So it's essentially testing that the protocol that we were using, we had implemented correctly. So a lot of the work, wherever we could, we used existing implementations from Java at, on the broker side and wherever we could, we did that on the client side as well. Um, we've had other people test it as well externally over the years. 
uh, once it was in there and it started going into production. Right. Okay. So there you are. You, I, I'm assuming that SSL is relatively straightforward to add to the communication layer. Tell me if I'm wrong. So at the very beginning, it was a little bit more difficult because of the way Kafka was implemented and the fact that we had assumed that everything is plain text. So refactoring it and getting the protocol in at the beginning was a little bit more work. But once the code was in there and we had uh, you know, support for multiple security layers, uh, security protocols and the, uh, multiple transport layers, which is where the SSL fits in, it became a lot easier. Now the only work that we need to do is when a new protocol comes along, like TLS 1.3 came along a few years ago. And when you're integrating, you find that there are small changes that we need to make to make sure that the new protocol, the, uh, the some of the assumptions that we made before may not be working at the, in, in, our, um, in Kafka, so we have to update it slightly every time. So now it is much more incremental. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine it's like classic software problem, making it swappable at all is hard work, but once you've made it swappable. Yeah, I learned that lesson hard in internationalization once. We went from <laughs> we went from English to English and German, and that was a colossal amount of work. But then adding each new language after that was yes. pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so the first uh, authentication mechanism you added was Kerberos. That's right. Which all I know about, you're going to have to teach me something about Kerberos here, because all I know is it's kind of a bit like OAuth, in which you ask someone else for authentication and you go over there and say, look, I've got my magic token. Yeah. So it is kind of similar in that way. But Active Directory, which supports Kerberos, has been around for a long time. It's used by a lot of financial institutions. Mm. So that is, and when security was added to Kafka, it seemed like a, a very good fit in the sense that a lot of people wanted to use it to secure Kafka would have already had Active Directory setups, which they could connect to if we supported Kerberos. And so we introduced SASL, which is a standard, a standard framework for introducing security mechanisms into, uh, uh, into basically any system. Uh, so we use SASL, which is already supported in Java, and introduced SASL uh, okay. GSS API, which supports the Kerberos protocol. And that's how the very first protocol was added. It was just support for Kerberos, which was great at the time because um, a lot of people who were using Active Directory could straight away start using the system with no additional uh, uh, thing, uh, no additional plugins that you had to add to Kafka. So it was uh, if you had this uh, external server, then it became very simple. Right, right. So that opens up a lot of enterprise e type companies yes. using it, right? Yeah. yeah. I can. And was it largely driven by the, just the realization that you wanted to get this product into the cloud and working that way? Or was it customers saying, we can't use this until you can integrate with our Active Directory? So uh, uh, Kerberos was more about, uh, less about cloud and more about um, on-premise on users who oh. are already had um, they already had Active Directory setups that they wanted to integrate. I think at the time that was the main driving factor for introducing Kerberos first. I think slowly we realized that Kerberos itself wasn't um, sufficient. If um, for a lot of users who are running Kafka in cloud, you, you're much more likely to have a username and password authentication, uh, which uh, with your own kind of some backend that gives you some support for authenticating passwords. Yeah. So that's how we introduced the next protocol, which was SASL Plane, which allows you to verify your passwords. So it is a, it's a much simpler protocol. So if you have any kind of uh, username and password database, you can integrate it with it and you specify username and password and it verifies the password. The other right. side could be LDAC, for example, again with Active Directory, and you can still bind to it and verify. But the way we would do that is by adding, uh, by extending and adding a callback handler to integrate with whatever backend that you may have. Okay. So it, it is gradually becoming, at this stage, much more pluggable like that. Yes. So we started off originally with, if you wanted to replace something, you had to replace the entire security provider. So Java is good that way. It allows you to uh, you know, plug in any security provider into your process. But that became increasingly difficult. Um, like everyone has to replace this entire SAS server and in order to do um, something like password authentication. So 
we started making the interfaces much more pluggable. Today, if you wanted to change, uh, you know, plug into your own password database uh, to do the verification, all you need to do is implement the a single simple callback, which verifies whether the password is correct. Right. Yeah. And it, what was the development process for that like? I mean, was it just all internal and bang here? It's available, or was it? Were you bike shedding series of kips what was life like getting that yeah. feature in so uh, in apache kafka whenever you change anything that is public it, it's an interface adding a new config it goes to the um, the kafka improvement proposal which is the kip so we originally had a kip for uh, adding kerberos but then we added another one for sassel plane which was just adding the mechanism into kafka with uh, the ability to change it but then another kip came along as we found that that wasn't sufficient. We did another kip, which was to change the whole interface and make everything much more pluggable. Right. But I mean, what, was the, what was the process like on those? Were they hotbeds of debate or was it fairly easy to reach agreement? So uh, some of these do take time, especially when um, there are, uh, you know, we have to make sure that nothing breaks. So with one of the most critical things when you're adding anything to Kafka is that we preserve compatibility. So it is quite critical that um, we have lots of eyes on it to make sure that nobody's setup breaks as a result. So when we introduced Kerberos initially, we did not add a mechanism to plug in another another SASL mechanism. So there was this assumption within the code base that everything is Kerberos. So when we had to add SASL plane, um, we had to change it slightly so that we can detect the old product, the old clients connecting, assuming everything is code ROS, versus this new one, which needs to negotiate the mechanism. Oh, so, God. Yeah. So that goes to the process where um, you know, the discussions in the process to make making sure that um, nothing is breaking at this point, and right. also the testing, obviously, to make sure that the compatibility is retained. Yeah. Did that eventually get uh, deprecated out, or do we still do that dance today? We still do that. So we haven't removed, um, you know, in terms of authentication, we haven't removed any of the support that we had before. After we did that uh, that initial protocol change, we also added more work, uh, did more work later on to make it even much easier to evolve the protocol. So now it's actually, the whole SASL thing goes through a Kafka protocol. It's all, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a, a Kafka message that goes through which contains the SASL bytes. So it becomes much more easier for us to version and uh, check. So it, it took a few kips to get there, but I think it's in a much better shape now than it was before. Right, yeah, especially coming from zero, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So is that is that the end of the uh, authentication story? Is it like you can now plug in anything you want, so we're done here? So... Uh, so we did the SASL plane, and then we made it pluggable. But some of the other things that we have done, we added Scram, for example. So one of the problems we had at the time was that if you wanted to integrate authentication into Kafka, if you weren't using SSL and you wanted to use SASL, you had to write. You either had to have a setup like Active Directory, or you had to write a plugin to connect to something like uh, your your own password database. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Having something which is totally built into Kafka, where it didn't need an external server, is useful for people who are starting off with security and don't have other systems. So we introduced SASL's clan, which is slightly stronger protocol than SASL plane because the password is not sent directly on the wire. So it's it's safer that way. It's sorted and scanned before it's sent across. So right. we introduced that into Kafka, where um, the, the, the sorted passwords are stored in Zookeeper. And you, as long as you protect your zookeeper, it was I think that you could protect it, but you put it in an internal network and protect that. You could use security with Kafka without introducing an extra uh, a third party system. Okay, so so zookeeper then becomes your database of password stuff, and it you know, just yeah. right. But we don't store plain passwords in there. That was the key for using Scram as opposed to um, plain. Yeah, yeah, because you don't want to, if you can avoid it, you don't want to um, send and store unencrypted passwords, all right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in um, fact, I'm going to take that back. If you can avoid it, you must avoid it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, that raises, I know this is always a question on people's lips. Does that raise new work now we're trying to get rid of Zookeeper? Uh, 
Yes. So this is something that we need to do because it, when you introduce when something is stored in Zookeeper, it was easy for even brokers to use that. So interbroker communication could use Scrum because um, Zookeeper starts up first, and then the brokers come up. Yeah. With in the Kraft mode, we need to make sure that um, you know it, it's a slightly more difficult because if you want to use Scrum for uh, uh, in, interbroker communication as well. How do you bootstrap? So there's work that is happening now to make sure that that can be done. Give me a clue on how you actually solve that problem. Um, <laughs> I mean, how, how do you... Because Zookeeper, right, it's great. It's right there and it's a distributed database, right? Yeah. You don't have that anymore. How's that handled? Yeah, I think there's a whole... There's a separate bootstrap process to make that happen. Right, uh, okay, okay. Maybe we should uh, put links to the kip and move on from the technical details of that. But so, yeah, I know. After Scrum, we also realized that OAuth was becoming more popular. So, uh, you know, it was useful to have an implementation in Kafka which supported OAuth. So that was the final authentication protocol that we have added to Kafka. Okay, yeah, that, that's probably my go-to choice for that kind of authentication tasks i'm glad we is that why because i know fairly recently confluent cloud let you log in with um google and i think one other a uh, facebook as well wasn't it as your authentication provider you can sign up with those now mm-hmm. is, is that just piggybacking off the oauth work you've done yeah so if you once you have a token then it becomes easy to authenticate using your OAuth. Uh, so and that was because it's part of Apache Kafka. It is available in Confluent platform okay. and cloud as well. Yeah, that, that's a question we should keep an eye on. How much of this is going straight into Kafka? How much of this is just in the open source Apache Kafka? So, uh, so initially when we introduced OAuth, it was added as a, it, it was added as a pluggable uh, mechanism into Kafka with an insecure impl- default implementation. So, if you wanted to use OAuth, you would go and write your own a uh, plugin which acquired the tokens. So because there are so many libraries out there, we didn't want to pick one and say, this is how you acquire tokens. Instead, yeah. um, we provided the framework. But the downside of that was anybody who wanted to use OAuth had to go and implement this Java plugin before they could even get started. Yeah. So the adoption took, you know, was slow. And people who were already using it, maybe, um, and really required it, were using it. But um, it didn't get adopted at the speed that it would have if um, we had, you know, if it worked straight out of the box. So a new kit recently has added support for uh, secure robots into Apache Kafka. So that right. is a, a open source as well. Right. So there's a default one if you don't want to bring your own. Yeah. 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 Common, another common software development pattern, make it work at all and then make it user friendly, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is... Is that does that bring us up to date on the first leg of security, which is authentication? Yeah, I think um, we've come a long way since we started, and now I think um, the people who want to start integrating authentication into Kafka find it. Uh, there are various ways to do it, but there are various ways that work out of the box as well. So, yes, okay. I think so. Okay, so uh, let's pause for a second. You're the security expert. Where we've covered that's authentication. We need authorization next. Give me the difference. Define so, authentication and authorization. So authentication is the process of defining who you are. So it's uh, essentially checking your digital signature and making sure that you are who you say you are. It kind of works both ways. So it is uh, it, when a client is connecting to a broker, the, uh, the client identity is uh, validated by the broker. So that is a client authentication. And equally, the client, before it sends its um, sensitive data onto the broker, needs to verify that it's sending it to the actual broker, not some okay. manual. So that I didn't is realize it was two-way in this. That's cool. It's two ways. So and that whole process is essentially answering the question, who? Uh, who are you? So authorization, on the other hand, is about what you can do. So it's having established an identity and make sure that you are, you are who you say you are. Authorization determines what you're allowed to do. So it's basically authentication is who and authorization is what. Right, yep. It's it's fairly easy to, to identify if someone is or isn't Mick Jagger, but that doesn't mean they can come into your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stretching that metaphor, yes. Um, let's move on from that metaphor. Um, right, so authorization. <laughs> 
presumably at the start, there was no authorization mechanism either. No. So like anyone who can connect can do anything. Of, yeah. Without authentication, everybody is playing text. So but, you, know, you can't authorize. So, but once authentication came along, you could identify. When, during authentication, we establish an identity. It's called Kafka principle. So, and this identity is associated with the connection throughout its lifetime. And uh, once you've got your identity, whenever a request comes in, I want to read this topic, you, you, you check that you can plug in an authorizer and the authorizer verifies that this identity is allowed to read that topic. Basically, what action is it allowed to perform? So Kafka has a pluggable authorizer, which has very fine grained accuracy, and you can specify basically what operations on what resources each identity, each principle is allowed to perform or not allowed to perform. How fine grain was that in the first version? So to start with, it was but it, it's very fine grain in the sense that the only way you could define was either you had to specify the full topic name. So if you're accessing foo, you would say this user is allowed to access foo. And we had one sort of wildcard thing. You could say all of us or users are allowed to access foo, or you could say this user is allowed to access anything. Yeah. So those were the only two uh, modes that we had, either sort of blanket access to a principal or to a resource, or you had specific access to a particular resource. But right. that it doesn't work in, if you are a very large organization and you have you know, thousands of topics and thousands of users, then very quickly this could become um, you know, really difficult to manage. If you have a million actors, yeah. it's not very really easy to keep track of them. You're likely to make mistakes. So later on... Sorry, at that stage, was it also like, could you specify read and write separately? Yeah, we could specify. The operations okay. haven't changed that much. I think we have, right from the beginning, we had uh, separate operations uh, right. for read, write, um, access configs and so on. Right, okay. Uh, read configs or auto configs and so on. But one of the things that we added later to help larger organizations manage their access was to add prefixed access. So if you follow best practices and um, you know use separate prefix for different departments, for example, then it becomes much easier to say that this user is allowed to access topics with this prefix. So you have a much smaller number of actors, uh, and that becomes much more easier to manage. Okay, so you're just naming each role with like finance underscore Dave. Exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, and this is available out of the box. But I, again, just like authentication, everything is uh, customizable in Kafka. So, one of the things you can do is to integrate with your own, uh, for example, an LDAP server, and uh, it, then you will be also be able to do group-based authentication or role-based authentication, which makes it even much easier to manage in terms of your, if you have an organization which already has these users in LDAP and you are using LDAP-based authentication then you could also use the groups and roles that are defined in LDAP, making it much easier for you to manage. Yeah, yeah. But that sounds like, again, a thing where if you're an enterprise, you probably have an LDAP server. Yes. And the rest of us maybe don't. So what happened for those people? Yeah, and that's part of the reason why the prefix tackles are important. I think this is totally out of the box. You don't need to add anything. It's all contained within Kafka and makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. If you don't have external servers that you if you don't want to manage external servers with this information. Right, yeah. Okay, so is that, we've got authentication, that's authorization. Is that the whole story for authorization? So, so yeah, we have, so one of the other things that if you're doing authorization is also auditing. So, uh, the more, uh, so yeah. built into Apache Kafka is, uh, every time when you're doing authorization, we also log a message which says, um, somebody was allowed to do something or somebody was not allowed to do something. Okay. And uh, these logs, uh, this is a log with your logs, which you, you can use the L stack and get it into something like Kibana. And uh, you can also look out for abnormal patterns or uh, increase in, uh, you know, denied access, for example. So, it, so that's another way that you can, you know, keep ahead and monitor and see that if there is, there are any attempts to access data that you don't expect. Okay, yeah. But if that goes into a... I'm surprised it goes into a log4j file. How come it doesn't just go onto another topic? So uh, there are organizations which do that. Confluent, for example, does have an audit um, feature which um, sends it directly to a topic. 
Okay. But there is a cost to it as well. So, if, for example, um, if you are, uh, we authorize every produce request. So, every produce request may have, uh, you know, 100 records for 100 different partitions. We are essentially authorizing each of them. So, it's a lot of volume of data that comes out of authorization. Right. So, you need to so be you can, about. but it's not the default. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, we've got authentication, authorization. I think the next leg of this is probably encryption, right? Yes. Tell me what's available encryption-wise. So uh, so the very first thing that everyone thinks of for encryption is you're sending data out the wire. It may be the public internet. You want to make sure that data in transit is encrypted. So yeah. TLS support the, uh, that we added gives you that. So if you enable TLS, then you've got uh, encryption for everything that's going over the wire. Another thing almost everyone does is encrypt the disk so that data is first is encrypted. So, so together, basically all the data is encrypted. But if you're running on the cloud, even that may not be sufficient. You want to make sure that your cloud provider doesn't see your data. You may be, uh, have very sensitive data that you don't want anybody else to see, and that's where end-to-end -end encryption helps. So that's where the producer uh, encrypts the data using some key and the consumer who has access to the same key can see the data, but nobody else can, so not even the broker. Okay. So is that, so are you encrypting each message, each, each record batch? Yeah. So it's it's at the level of the, the packet you send over the producer that gets encrypted? Yeah. Okay. What does it take to actually implement that? Because I would have thought you could you could just do that encryption yourself with no support from Kafka at all. Yeah. If you want so to. you can add an interceptor which does the encryption. But the only thing you need to worry about when you're doing it to an encryption is um, in the performance of it and how it interacts with the compression. Does it reduce how much you can compress? Right. So it's mostly about performance, um, but it can be done um, with, without changes to Kafka. And okay. I think a lot of people do. But, but you baked it in as a, as a change? No, it's not big enough as a change. It's, oh, okay, so it's just something you, you bring your yeah. own encryption? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool. So, okay, that's... Do you think it will ever be sort of built in? Because if you're using multiple clients, that does seem like an overhead. Yeah, I think uh, over time, maybe we would have features which enable this much more easily than you, you have been today. Right. Because today you have to write the code to make it happen, so yes. Okay. Someone's going to open a kip and flag you to review it at some yeah. point in the <laughs> future. <laughs> so there's your future work stack. Uh, okay, well, you made you made the encryption part sound rather easy. Uh, it is easy if you didn't want it to end encryption because everything is built in. Uh, you use tools for your disk encryption and you use um, a TLS for uh, your uh, the data on transit. It's when you start doing end-to-end -end encryption, it's, it is more work because it, it's, it is a lot of testing to make sure that you are trying to do that. And also, you might, might not want to encrypt the whole message. You may be encrypting fields, in which case, you know, it's a certain fields of your message, in which case you need to integrate with uh, something like a schema registry to um, track what field needs to be encrypted. So there's a lot of work okay. in that area that is done, but not as part of the core Kafka work in Apache Kafka. Okay. What, what's the schema registry support? How do you? How does that work? <clears throat> If you could track what uh, what is sensitive and yeah. uh, you know keep move the encryption outside of uh, in, into a tool, yeah. I mean, so uh, but is that something that's there today, or you you're just talking? You add some metadata to the Avro record that Schema Registry happens to store. Yeah, I don't I don't know whether we have any support for it today because it's again it's not part of uh, the Apache Kafka stack. So. Okay, we, we are doing podcast speculation-driven development. <laughs> <laughs> I'll coin that term and I'll go on the circuit promoting it. <laughs> okay, so um, I, you mentioned um, auditing. But I guess that brings us to the fourth leg of this, which is things like quality of service, um, you know, um, denial of service attacks. There's another security topic. So, uh, again, when we started off, we didn't have any way to mitigate denial of service. There was no concept of quotas. But over the years, we have added various different types of quotas to make sure that we can handle, we can you know, 
distribute the load fairly, but also uh, prevent the amount of load on brokers. So one of them is to restrict the amount of bandwidth to produce or the rate at which you can produce or consume. And you can associate these, uh, you can set up these quotas based on either users or you can just set up defaults. So which basically controls how much quota, how much bandwidth can uh, each user can use. Then we also have CPU level request quotas, which can determine how much of the thread time you are talking. So you can't just keep on sending requests which are not produced and uh, consumed, but uh, maybe just get metadata. They all cost. So it, we have all these quotas and there are connection level quotas. So they all kind of uh, are there to help with reducing the amount of load and preventing um, denial of service. Okay, but how how expressive is that? Can you say, I don't know, you can only send 100 megabytes a minute or can you actually say you can have as much as you want, but if someone else gets busy, then you're going to be limited to 100 megabytes a minute? Uh, I mean, no, is I it, can, you, can you be bursty? That's what I'm asking. Can you be bursty if things are quiet? Uh, but at the moment, no, I think. <laughs> but again, we have made this also customizable. So you can write your own plugins which do uh, specific things. I think one of the areas that we did make it burst to was where we are controlling the rate at which topics are created and partitions are created. That we do allow it to be burst to because that's likely to be burst to traffic. But the overall bandwidth, we expect that it's kind of stays, um, at least the default implementation assumes that you are setting it at the rate uh, and we don't allow. But we are monitoring over periods of time and if uh, it exceeds over uh, whatever the window that you have set, then you get throttled. Essentially, you, you, you won't be given any data for a period of time. Right, yeah. So what, let's step back a second. So you you see this with two hats on, right? You see this as a program committee member for Apache Kafka. You also see it as a Confluent employee working on the cloud side. Do, do the two support each other? Do you... Do you see different usage patterns? Is what's 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 the tension informing each one? So I think um, so. When you're running a cloud service like in um, Confluent Cloud, we have a multi-tenant cluster. So the basic, the defaults don't all, aren't always sufficient because you are also trying to protect tenants from each other. So we have extended because the um, whole of the quota in Apache uh, Kafka is extensible and customizable. We have our own implementation in uh, cloud, which allows us to handle more uh, relative to the multi-tenancy. Oh, right. Okay. So you're, yeah. But are you finding like, I mean, it's, I think one of the big differences, if you're working on a cloud team, you have this deployed and you're actively seeing the problems, right? Yeah. So yeah. do you, does the reality of sticking up in the cloud inform stuff that ends up eventually back in the open source model? Yes, I think one of the advantages of uh, running a cloud service is you, you get uh, feedback very, very quickly on what is working, what is not working, and what right. could be improved. And I think a lot of that does feed back into Apache Kafka as well. As we, are, uh, as we learned over the years, we have contributed several features to Apache Kafka as a result of our experience of running the cloud service. Yeah, because it can be hard when you're doing... I mean, I've done much smaller scale open source work. And you en I found I end up prioritizing the features that affect me day to day because you've yeah. got harder visibility on other people's lives. Yeah, I've yeah. often wondered if doing a cloud service actually brings other people's problems to your doorstep in a useful way. Yeah, yeah. I you think so. And maybe, maybe leading into that, do you find that, I mean, is a lot of the feature development driven by people banging on your door asking for something? Or is it you see the gaps and these are your priorities, you think people need that? Yeah, I think it's a combination of the two. I and mean, a lot of the time, we are getting feedback from customers on you know what uh, what are the features that would be useful. But we are also seeing both for on-prem customers and for cloud customers uh, what you know, this some of the areas where we think we can help. And this applies to security as well as most of the other features that we work on. That uh, the feedback from customers is absolutely critical, and that's I think the product tends to take them and talk to a lot of customers to get 
to prioritize all the work that we need to do. Mm. Yeah, customer-driven development is probably better than podcast speculation-driven development, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> there goes those consulting fees. So um, maybe, maybe we should um, bring this to a close by saying, if I've just got a vanilla on-prem installation of Apache Kafka, what would be your top tips for security? What should I be worrying about first? I think one of the things when you start planning your deployment, think about incorporating security right from the start. So that um, so that includes using secure protocols, um, setting up some best practices to make sure that it's just not enough that to configure security. You need to make sure that um, if you're using passwords, you're using strong passwords and so on. So having all those best practices, uh, keeping that in mind. And that understanding your attack services and making sure that you have locked in as much as you possibly can. Don't expose Zookeeper, for instance, put it in its own uh, network. And um, you know, up upgrade your service as quickly as you, you can because we are fixing issues. Whenever we find issues, we are fixing them. The newer protocols like TLS 1.3 are far more stronger than the older ones like TLS 1.1, which where vulnerabilities have been found. So I think... Um, you know, using the latest versions with all the bug fixes and uh, integrating security very early on in your project is probably the more, it, it, quite, it would be very useful when, um, when you come later on and come to testing rather than leaving it to the end and then you find you have a little time to um, explore all the, um, you know, what the problems may be. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things you want to worry about as you approach production, but maybe you should probably focus on it sooner, right? <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you have a seven-year journey backfitting security systems into something that was originally just plain text. <laughs> well, this has been a very interesting tour of what's, what's available for security. Regini, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Cheers. We'll catch you again. And there we go, the current state of security for Kafka. You know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if in the next few years someone writes a pluggable traffic shaper that lets you specify custom quality of service things. And that would be terrifically useful around Black Friday, I think. Those kind of peak burst times. Um, maybe that's a kit that you could submit for me. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, in the meantime, if you want more concrete details on how you implement some of the security options we've talked about, head to developer.confluent.io because we've recently launched a step-by-step -step course for configuring Kafka security. That's presented by our very own Dan Weston. There's a link in the show notes and I'm sure you'll find it useful. Alternatively, if you'd like Confluent to take care of most of your security configuration issues, not all, but a lot of them, head to confluent.cloud and you can spin up a Kafka instance in the cloud and we will manage as much of it for you as we can. If you add the code PODCAST100 to your account, you'll get $100 of extra free credit um, to run with. And of course, if you've enjoyed this episode, now is a great time to click like and subscribe and notify and rate and review and the comment box and all the buttons that the world gives us. Or you can find my Twitter handle in the show notes if you want to get in touch. Uh, it's always great to hear from people. And with that, it just remains for me to thank Regini Savaram for joining us and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time.